I think to do anything, you need to know what the, what the possibilities and limitations are. Welcome to the Architect My Life podcast. I'm Aya Schlachter, your host, CEO of MGS Global Group, supporting architecture and design firms. We provide BIM modeling and drafting services to overwhelmed architects and design firm owners. On my podcast, I talk to successful women firm owners and entrepreneurs to discuss their challenges, share our experiences, and above all, celebrate each other's success. My core business, MGS Global, started as a part-time gig when I was a new mom. It has now grown to a thriving business, providing architectural support to the creatives, which helps everyone maintain a healthy work-life balance. The Architect My Life podcast is where I hope you learn to achieve your goals through genuine stories and conversations with other successful women in the industry. Now let's dive into this episode. Hello everyone, our guest this week is Michelle Kolbe. Michelle is a Chief Creative Officer, Co-Founder, and Head of Design of Evo Domus, a firm that specializes in the intersection of modern and green architecture. They create solid warm homes for people who are environmentally aware and love modern architecture. Michelle traveled to Europe after finishing her degree in architecture at Kent State University, gaining valuable international experience in residential, retail, and commercial design in both Germany and England. She collaborated with Pritzker Architecture Prize Award winner Arata Isozaki in his Berlin office in the mid-90s, soaking up the vibrancy and excitement of the post-reunification era in this truly amazing city. Her admiration of Bauhaus-inspired modernism, coupled with contemporary materials and advances in current building science, serve as a perpetual source of inspiration for her home designs. After 17 years abroad, she returned to the U.S., bringing with her a wealth of experience in the fields of energy-efficient architectural design, client relations, and construction management. I am so thrilled to talk to her today. Welcome to the show, Michelle. Hi, Aya. It's really great to be here. Tell us about a childhood experience a person or a place that influenced you to be who you are right now in your career in architecture. You know, that's really interesting, Aya, because I've, I've thought about that through the years. And I have to say, it is my dad. Um, my dad worked at a steel factory for most of his life, but his second job was building houses. And when I was young, I remember being in half-framed houses the smell of the sawdust, playing in the leftover concrete muck, which is probably very unhealthy, but, you know, you make pottery out of it then. And then years, decades later, talking to my mom, wondering why I spent so much time with my dad at a very young age on these construction sites. It turned out it was for a not-so-happy reason. It was uh, her mom, my grandma, was diagnosed with cancer, and my mom was busy at the hospital. So I was three, four years old on the construction site. But I do think that that had a happy effect, a positive influence on my feeling toward the built environment, a home, in particular a home, what it is and the different spaces, the rooms, the walls, and how great it was to have the uh, the drywaller put my name in the glue behind the drywall that he put onto the wall and sharing his lunch with me, all those different things that just had a very positive memory feedback for me. So you're really meant to be an ar- architect and in construction. Yes, I, I do think so. Even down to the Sunday magazine that came with our local newspaper would have an, a rendering and a floor plan. And I was just fascinated by those. And so I would get my poster board out and the ruler and pencil and I would create a scale and make my own floor plans, things like that. So it was it was really, even though I did not know a single architect, I grew up in the middle of nowhere, Ohio. I mean, really a very small town. Um, I think that innately it was just always there, my interest in it. So speaking about growing up from a small town, Johnson, Ohio, tell me about the process moving from Ohio after graduation in Kent State to Berlin. Like what prompted that? That was kind of crazy. So happily, I knew in high school yet that I wanted to study architecture because of what I just explained. And in general, my my drafting teacher facilitated, he actually adjusted his drafting class to include architecture because he knew I was interested. And so he made that a little bit more possible for me. And um, I knew immediately I wanted to study architecture, applied at Kent, went to Kent State University. 
And then at Kent State, every third-year student has the possibility to study abroad for half of a semester at the spring semester. And we did that. It's in Florence. And so 25 of my classmates and I spent two months in Italy. And it was fascinating and amazing and something like it was my first airplane ride. It was suddenly being someplace that wasn't Johnston, Ohio and wasn't Kent State University. It was breathtaking. That was third year. Fourth year, we had somebody visit us at Kent. It was the student president of the Architects Association of the AIA student version. And he, in passing and talking to us, mentioned a friend of his who was living in Paris. And I left that room knowing that I was going to move to Europe. I walked out of the room and and that was it. I'm moving to Europe. I can find a job. I can do this. Why not? And so it was a little bit shocking um, because it's a five-year degree. So one year later, I had a year to think about this and plan this. And really, 1992, graduated in May. And nine days later, my then-boyfriend and I were on a plane to Zurich, Switzerland, with a one-way ticket. Oh, wow. And that's how you ended up in Berlin yeah, or Zurich Yeah, Zurich first. first. Okay. Zurich, Switzerland, because a fellow student a year ahead of us was there. And he's like, yeah, come. It's pretty central, you know, American thinking. Europe is pretty small. So if you're in Zurich, you're close to everything. And it's a humorous thinking about it now. But being based there, we didn't, I didn't find work in Zurich. They, the Swiss are direct and honest. They said, you know... If we were to hire you, you would be the first one we would fire if, you know, we don't have any work. So I'm, like, thankful for that. But they actually suggested, two of the architects I interviewed with, why don't you try Munich or Berlin? Berlin might be interesting to you because the wall had just fallen. And, okay, hopped on a train, went up to Berlin. It was July 1992. And, yes, indeed, everybody was looking for architects. It didn't matter if you spoke German or not. You just needed to know how to draw. And oh, wow. I did know how to draw, indeed. So right place, right time. Absolutely. It was a perfect storm of everything that could be right. That's great. So how did you learn German? <laughs> Laboriously. Um, <laughs> it's not a very uh, sexy it, language. <laughs> it's not sexy, no. And I started in Zurich, so it didn't even make sense to like start learning it in the States because Schweizerdeutsch is much different than than Hochdeutsch. I learned it at the Goethe Institute at night school. I was wow. um, I was determined not to be um, a tourist. I was determined not to be the young, long haired, twenty three year old who would not be taken seriously. So it was really important to me to learn the language, to work as a professional in Berlin. So that's really. I think I took three classes. They were super expensive, four nights a week, four hours a night. And I took two class. I took a class, had four week or four months off to earn more money, took another class, did that three times. After the third one, I walked out and said, okay, I understand that they're talking about that topic in the past. And I understand that that person is talking about that topic in the future. I knew I was good. I was yeah. like, okay, I just have to add the vocabulary. So that was it. I, I studied German too for three months. No try Monaten in Regensburg. Oh, in Regensburg. Yeah, genau. Okay, that's it. <laughs> that's all genau. I know. <laughs> Ganz genau. So, so you became a member of Berlin Architect Kammer. What is that? Yeah, yeah. Architect and Kammer. Yeah. It's the AIA comparable. It's the same thing. It's being licensed in Germany. Wow, that's amazing. So you also worked with Arata Isozaki. Yeah, that was that was very interesting. I mean, at that time, that was 1994 through 96, I believe. And Potsdamer Platz was an area in the middle of the city that was a market, you know, where the, the Polish people would come over and sell things to the Germans. And then it was shut down and all of the big buildings started coming because Bonn, the, the capital of Germany, was being moved from Bonn to Berlin. So there was a lot of money that was being pumped into the city of Berlin And all of the famous architects were there. Renzo Piano was actually the lead architect on the entire area at the center of the city. And a lot of famous architects were there. So it was it was a great time, you know. It was really nice. And actually, the German architect who headed up that office for Arada, I still have contact with him. He's actually now, he was in Austri- Australia for a while, and now he's in Las Vegas. So it's interesting to think about that time in that city. It was fascinating and thrilling. That's great. So how did you move or get from Berlin to England 
and back to Ohio. Yeah, that's kind of, let me think. So Berlin, we were there for 13 years. And then I met Alexander, partner now, and we worked together in Berlin. Uh, things were slowing down in about 2001, 2002. It actually hit the rest of the city before it hit us. We had a lot of English clients, shopping centers. But then it eventually did slow down for them too. They pulled out of the city. Our big projects were dying. And then we got an opportunity to work in England for a German prefab house builder with whom Alexander had worked in his early years. And we were still, it's a strange story, Aya, we were still storing those files from like a decade earlier in our basement that we were going to give up because it was just storage. And he was going to chuck them. I'm like, you know what? Don't throw those away. It's Hoof House. I bet they might want them because it's a family company. It's big. So he reached out to the uh, the owner, the, the company owner, and he's like, Herr Kolbe, I can't believe you're calling at this point in time. We are desperately looking for an architect in England. Wouldn't you like to move to England and and head up the uh, part of the architecture program there for our Hoof House? And so that was actually a very gentle release from Berlin and start in England, which was fascinating for both of us because for me it was English speaking, which was a novelty to be able to, to speak English every day instead of German. And it was it's a beautiful country. So I really we enjoyed our time there. That was that was wonderful. Like four years, right? Yeah, four years. And it was part of, partially with um Hoof House and part of the time then we transitioned over to Balfritz. So what are what is, is it a construction company as well? They are house builders. Both of them are house builders. Germany is very well known for their prefab house manufacturing. They have a lot of different companies, but Hoof House and Balfritz are actually I would say most well-known and environmentally conscientious and just really solid companies who who care about everything that they do. And so th I think the experience there, that transition in England, impacted my life hugely, Alexander and my life both. It was something for him, it started even earlier, but for me, in particular now, it's a little bit jumping, sorry, Aya, but the Balfritz impact was even more because Balfritz is more of, um, you cannot identify a Balfritz house. A hoof house is very identifiable, a lot of glass, timber framed, lovely, but it always looks like a hoof house. Balfritz, on the other hand, is more of a system, and if you work with the rules of the system, you can build anything. Is this like a, the passive house concept? No, no, it's oh, not even oh. that. They are, um, I'm, I'm sure it'd be very easy to Google specify <laughs> a Balfritz yeah. to be a, a passive house. Oh. But Balfritz is a company name. It's a family-owned company, and they build panelized prefab houses in Germany. Not just in Germany, they're produced in Germany, but they deliver to everywhere in Europe, as well as England, which is where we lived. And so we designed many houses for Balfritz. And when then 2008 happened, leading into the next question you're probably going to ask me, how did you get to the States? The end of 2008, August, September, uh, when all of the clients started canceling, it was the global crisis. And I'm like, oh, well, that's interesting. What are we going to do now? <laughs> And so we um, actually carried everything that we had learned and the systems and processes from mainly Balfritz. That was what was in the back of our mind when we created Evo Domas. Wow. So what is, was it a reverse culture shock for an American to come back home after <laughs> 17 years? Yeah. yeah, actually, it could have been. But I feel like I've lived a couple different lives. So at the age that I was... With the experience that I had already had, I feel like I was ready to come back anyhow. Also because I had Nikki. He was two and a half years old. I was pregnant with Natalie when this was happening. So I was six months pregnant when we realized that we needed to pick up and move to the States. So it was really okay to come back. My, my family's here. There were a lot of perks to it. There were a lot of things in place that facilitated actually making a new start having family there to catch the more basic crises like I need childcare and I need some support in general while we take on this new endeavor. 
we, we have similar paths because I also was gone and I moved back to the U.S. and we picked from New York to the Philippines and back to Cleveland because of family. Yes. Yeah. And I was a little shocked as well because I've never lived here, but yep. Cleveland is a great place and we're happy to have you in Cleveland. It's <laughs> nice to meet. Right. You know, I have to say. expat or what? Don't, Maybe not. You like, do meet yeah. a lot of people who have, for some reason, circled around to coming back to Cleveland. It's, it's kind of fascinating. Yes. I enjoy it. So tell me about Evo Domus. What does it mean? Ev- first oh, Evo Domus means evolution of the home. Oh, is it Latin? Evo Domus, yeah. And um, you know what? We searched long and hard for a name that meant something to us and that was identifiable and that had a .com if you want to be very practical about this. Um, it, it really, it was three three solid weeks of going through a lot of different possibilities and um, I have to say, I, I'm still very happy with, with the name and what it means to us. And it's a talking point also. People ask. And it's not evil donuts. No, it's <laughs> Evo Domus. And it starts the conversation about why that would be important to us. And it's like a soft start into describing what our principles are. So it's it's interesting. So I love how your business is really very holistic and you've actually niched down and that's this is the problem with a lot of architects they do everything right they do residential retail but you've actually niched down and i think your niche and correct me if i wrong if i'm wrong is custom high end prefab sustainable homes so my question is prefab here in the us is not really you can't consider it high end and custom and sustainable so how do you sell to your clients obviously if you check evodomus.com, you'll see all their amazing work, which we'll talk about later. Mm-hmm. So how do you find clients? Sure. Now, I have to say, we don't really need to go out and find them. Because of the time that we're living in with the internet, people find us. People actually put in the right Google search terms. And I would say Dwell Magazine has facilitated a lot. It is a magazine that many people are familiar with. It either speaks to a client or not, or wouldn't be a client, and it speaks to a person or not. And most of our clients know the magazine. They know the architecture, the aesthetic. And it is just the one hard copy place that we do advertise. Other than that, a lot of Google searches. Anybody who um, wants to build a home that is modern, they might land with us. Sustainable, even better that they will land with us, prefab in every case. And we might not be on the first page, but I found actually in my personal life and in hearing from clients, that doesn't matter because if you're looking for somebody to build your home, you will continue to page two and three because those on page one are often just paying to be on page one. They're not necessarily going to be the right fit for you. Anybody who finds us has really done deep searches and done a lot of research to find us. So can you explain to the non-architects or even people who are not familiar with prefab homes, what does that process or design process look like from ideation, sketching, all the way to construction? I saw in Michelle's Instagram that she was directing all these cranes of different homes put together in, what, two days? Mm -hmm. So can you explain the process? Sure. So um, the process in general, I think to do anything, you need to know what the what the possibilities and limitations are. So really in with prefab, and I was brought to modular prefab by a, a client who saw one of our first houses, saw actually our first house here as Evo Domus, which was a panelized house. And she said, Michelle, I have a land around the corner. She came to an open house after this house was set. She said, I have land around the corner, um, but I'm thinking about modular. Michelle, I think you can do it. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So I looked into the modular construction aspect of of building here. And I have to say, once you know the rules, you have so much freedom. You can put these modules together in so many different ways to realize almost any design. And because we're not, our design language is not angles and curves, it's ideal, right? We are, are more rectilinear, anyhow, uh, volumes, niches, push and pull of spaces. So really the possibilities with the modularized offsite construction, it was almost like a perfect fit. 
Another completely different aspect that has appealed to me so much about building the way we do. Okay, and that said, 40% of our homes are site-built. About 60% are modular. There are logistic reasons why you can't always deliver modules to a site. Um, But let's just go to the module aspect of it. I love, I'm super creative, but at the same time, I am analytical and I love processes and predictability and control. And by building usually half of the financial scope of a project in a factory and knowing very early what the timing and cost will be, that's attractive to everybody. And that's one of those dangers with um, custom building that the budget can easily go out of control when you know everything is, is in the hands of a local contractor or an, and the trades and subcontractors. So for me, um, just knowing the design rules, the possibilities, the capabilities, and um, knowing that we can control timing and financials, it's, uh, it's just like a, a nice package. So how long does it take to build, to put together a house once it's in, on site? Okay. Like so, a typical yeah, house. Yeah. So once those modules have been pulled to the site on the trucks, those big semi-trucks, um, the set is typically two days. Uh, most of our homes are four, five, six, sometimes seven modules of varying sizes. We will have the foundations in place already, typically the precast. So we arrive at 7.30 in the morning, the crane's ready to go, start lifting the end of the first day, typically three or four modules have been set. The end of the second day, all of them have been set, and the set crew has begun with the connections and the adjustments. So we leave typically then on the third day after a walkthrough with a client and the local contractor, and it exists. I mean, it is air sealed. The windows are in the the weather resistant barriers on the outside. It's locked up, air watertight. Only thing that needs to be done is, of course, then the local scope, which is not little. We never want to have a home that looks like it was created out of boxes, right? So we, we, we go ahead and bite the bullet and say it's worth it for the local contractor to require four or five months to finish the house to make it look like it is just a gorgeous piece of modern architecture. I can attest to that for sure. Oh, thank you, Aya. So as a woman who's extremely hands-on, I mean, yeah, starting at age three, right? <laughs> right, right. So what is it like to be on site and directing all these people? Yeah, okay. I mean, you're the one, like, I, I've seen you. <laughs> yeah, no, what I find helpful is simply to let the guys, and it's almost always guys on site, not in the factory, I have to say, but on site, they are mostly men. They are almost always men. But I let I introduce myself and I let them know who I am and that I hired you just so that everything is clear that I I'm the one who's responsible for either this set going really well or for us to have problems. I want to I want them to know who to go to if they have concerns about anything. Because there, there are a lot of different contracts going on then. We've got the local contractor who usually has never facilitated a module construction. I've got our Evodomus team who's always there. We've got the crane hired by the local contractor. We've got the drivers hired by me, the set crew hired by me. And I just want them to, to identify, you know, come to us if you need help with anything. Typically they don't. It, it's like, oh, got it. And I've never been disrespected. I have to say, if as a woman, you know this, you come from a place of experience, sex is not the topic. That's good that you actually manage expectations up front. It's easier that way. They don't get embarrassed. Yeah. You know. That's great. You're probably one of the first women who I've known that are just like, I'm the boss. You listen to me. No, just kidding. But that's what it is. But really manage the expectations that I'm responsible what you said, I'm responsible for making this flow properly yeah. without litigation or danger. Exactly. We have all the same goal. We want this to go well. And it's not even, not even I'm the boss, but like this is going to financially cost me personally money if we get this wrong. So let's all dig in together. I love that. <laughs> so you mentioned that you were fascinated by learning about the psychology when dealing with people. Yes. So since you're in the residential space, residential clients are notoriously known to be difficult and high needs, which is 
understandable because it's their own house, right? So how do you deal and navigate with difficult clients, especially husbands and wives who don't have the same design ideas? <laughs> A lot of people end up in divorce during the construction phase. So since you're client-facing, how do you manage difficult um, situations? Yeah, that's a very, very good question, Saya. I think managing is accomplished by listening, first of all, and dealing with it sometimes with humor and usually almost no, always with sincerity and being honest and open. It's like, okay, I recognize that there's a bit of an issue here with this or that, so how can we move forward to make everybody happy because at the end of the day, the entire family needs to be happy with the home that we're going to make for you. Um, and, you know, the psychology of all of this, you know, it, it applies to the clients, it applies to the contractors, the consultants, to the factory, you know, the team working in the factory. It's all, I come from a place of respect. Everybody knows what they're doing in certain areas, and we are all brilliant in certain areas and all idiots in other areas. My clients, is the same way, and most of them admit, I know a lot about what I do, but I don't know a lot about what you do. I know what I, ex what I think I expect, but maybe you can fill me in. So basically, what I do is I educate along the way, and that helps everybody. It facilitates decision-making, it helps to understand why we need to say stop with any changes at a certain point in time because they've come to me for uh, an expedient experience. And um, yes, even though this is your home and you should be able to decide everything you want, at the same time you've tasked me with making sure that it is finished around a certain date. So all of these different things, through the years, it's communicating experience, um, education, talking about expectations, what's possible, what's not possible, all those, those things kind of lead into it. And everybody deep down, 95% of people are decent people. They sometimes just don't know how to express themselves and sometimes they need to hear that it's all in the tone, that emails can be dangerous. Like if you have a problem, go ahead and send, give me a call. If you're not sure, it can be less abrasive than a two-liner. You know, it just really, it's all in how you communicate with people, with both sides. So I really think a lot of problems can be solved by just picking up the phone because I agree, an email could be misread. Yes. And the tone. Yes, yes. So, and it's usually coming from a place of fear. We are building millions of their dollars. I get where their fears might be, right? So it's okay. So apart from Evo Domus and your residential business, you also ventured into the Evo Domus kitchen and bath. Yeah. You also have a building in Cleveland Heights with a really wonderful showroom. You sell windows and, and doors and other building materials. So I always say this and ask my guests who are very successful women, creative entrepreneurs. I say creatives were taught how to master their craft, but not taught how to run or grow a business. But where did you get your business savviness, Michelle? Who? Oh, that's a really good question, Aya. Yeah, I've never liked the idea. And it's with my sisters, my mom, my dad, we're quite independent people. And really that I like to control my destiny. So in terms of having the additional business selling building products, we like to be able to present what we specify in our homes. We have very particular tastes and expectations, and we want to present everything to our clients um, hands-on and not rely on having to buy certain things from other people. And so we go directly to manufacturers then. We find our favorite building products and either sell them directly or I like I would never send a client to um, a tile warehouse or even Thomas Brick or Virginia Tile. It's overwhelming. So I pre-select everything. I make sure that we have directly in our showroom everything that I would want in my own home. And if they've come to us, typically it's in line with their aesthetics too. So, so I really like how you streamlined your design process because if I go to Home Depot, there are like a, t a thousand different tiles. Overwhelming. So, and I, I, one thing that people don't know, Michelle, and El, I mean, Evo Domos also does international projects, and they have a project in the Philippines, where I'm from, <laughs> and one of their clients is from Cebu, where I'm where from. Where she's from. <laughs> and I, like, how did a Cebuana end up in Cleveland Heights, right? It's like, 
they came all the way to Mich- uh, Ivo Domo's showroom to pick all the tiles. And you have houses all over the world. I mean, Colombia, Philippines, uh, and you know, all over the country. The country, yeah. I would yeah. say those were the, those were two extreme cases. And of course, they're not prefab. But um, you know, I tell you, I it's a funny story in general how the the whole Philippine connection because I met you through Rob, Rob, or, <laughs> and here we are sitting, and it, it's a it's a very funny thing. And then to find out that you're from Cebu and. The Wongs are from Cebu. That's where the project is. And indeed, they had been uh, uh, connected with us for 10 years. The property that they had was sitting there for 10 years while they were each attending to their individual businesses. And then her health started failing. And they're like, okay, he needs to build something. As he says, I want to build a very healthy home for my wife. And so he came and he vetted us. And it was not his thing and he admitted that he was quite anxious when he came in um, to our showroom and he started talking to us, but he stayed for three hours. We had sushi together afterwards. And he said, I am so happy that I overcame my anxiety. It has been so nice. <laughs> so- no, I, I've always told Michelle that when I redesign my kitchen, I'm going to get an Evo Domus kitchen, Happily. even though I, I was trained as an residential architect. <laughs> Michelle is doing the kitchen. That's for sure. So. So I'm really glad we got to really connect during the pandemic. You know, it was really tough, but, you know, we were kind of like COVID family kind of. We were, like, yeah. You know, we did barbecues together and going to your showroom was really nice. Like you had like exactly what you said, the tiles that you picked were cur- perfectly curated for your own homes. And it's really nice that your your clients can already choose from 10 instead of 100. Sure, yeah. Right? And then we've got, you know, our favorite plumbing fixtures, wood flooring. Having, um, we now have four kitchens there. So that, that really helps, even the handrails and the stairs. Just, um, so because it's kind of an odd thing, we don't have an Evo Domus show house here in Cleveland simply because I love where I live. I want to live in Cleveland Heights. I like living in a more urban atmosphere So um, the next best thing was to buy a dilapidated building and gut renovate it and make it an Evo Domus building. So now bringing people in, bringing our clients in from wherever we're building, everybody visits Cleveland for two or three days and is with us 24-7, you know, selecting and going through all the planning and we call it the fit out. And so really we're like mini cheerleaders for Cleveland at the same time um, in our little showroom workspace. It's, it's quite I've fun. I've been there for several happy hours. Yes, too. we have. <laughs> and I kind of want to live there because it's gorgeous. My kids say the same thing. <laughs> um, so you're one of the most hardworking, dedicated, and focused pe- persons that I know. Except and, you, Aya. And I Aya. really <laughs> admire you for that. So you mentioned that hard work, dedication, intelligence – and some simple optimism is all op- is possible. So is this how you manage to navigate your business during the pandemic? It is. It sincerely is. I, I think we all went through at least two or three months where we did not know if we were going to come out on the other side. And, um, you know, sometimes, or even uh, starting up the business, I think in general, if you know ahead of time all that can go wrong, none of us would do anything. So that's where I have to say the optimism bit. You simply have to trust the process, trust your strength, trust your intelligence to if you haven't made it through something before, that doesn't mean you won't make it through it. Just uh, do what you can and, and I guess position yourself to succeed, to come through. And at the end, uh, it did, right, Aya? Yeah, yeah we were like commiserating yeah yeah there were months where nobody nobody i knew had any idea if they were going to manage that yeah and we did and we did yes oh what a relief so so now that we're you know thankfully doing really well especially you guys have homes all over you have probably what eight to ten houses in the pipeline or more you know at at various stages like we're actually um heavy planning usually we stagger things but sometimes you can't control when the clients come. So we have three at the same stage right now. You know, we're a small team. There are four and a half of us. So, um, yeah, at, at various phases, I would say six right now are, wow. yeah, That's are happening great. in some aspect. So so uh, this, this question comes up, partnerships. 
a lot of people are on the fence about partnerships, especially working with your spouse or good friends. Mm -hmm. I, I know you have your spouse is your partner and you're one of your good friends from college yep. is also a partner. Yep. How does that work? The magic triangle, <laughs> humor. We we talk about this. Um, we've got different personalities as well as as different situations. Mike and I have known each other forever since um, second year in college. Um, Alexander and I, of course, are are married. So yeah, we've got that aspect. But then I've got uh, so we've got friends longer than the other spouse spouses yes two guys and a girl so there's a triangle that can be mixed and matched in many different ways bottom line is we all know where our strengths and weaknesses are and although there are overlaps necessarily because you do need to cover for each other every once in a while but we all know and trust our individual strengths and i think that is an invaluable asset when you are thinking about how to move from a solo practitioner or going it alone to going into a partnership. You need to find somebody where there's mutual respect and not 100% overlapping skill sets. You need some diversity in skill sets so that you can manage more. And also, we were talking earlier, you also are not afraid of hard conversations. No, correct? it's important because you can't sit there silently suffering or being angry with somebody you're working with because of whatever reason you really need to analyze your your own thoughts and what might be bothering you and then sit down and talk about it and say I'm having an issue here we need to to think about that usually again it's coming from like if Alexander's having a problem with something he's coming from a place of of worry you know ab about the timing and you know, if, if Mike and I are having issues with, with something else, it's from a, a place of we need to figure this, that, and the other out. And everyone has different areas of, of knowledge. And coming together and discussing them and analyzing data, at this point in time, we have 15 houses under our belt in this way. And it's a new process. This is not common. What we do is not common. Nobody else would do it. It's not a shark tank business, right? That's it's not true. scalable. It's very much personality based. So everything that we do is analyze it, learn from past mistakes, better ways, better processes, softwares, whatever it takes to improve every step of, of our process. That's what's missing in a lot of small, you know, it is farm owners process is not even something people talk about but that's how you're su successful it has to be repeatable you cannot waste any minute you know looking for something you have to have a process in place in place I love it. yeah me too actually yeah <laughs> i love so beauty i love processes <laughs> i love predictability <laughs> i mean later on we'll share all our links to your your you know websites wonderful it's, it's really amazing i i want to show evo domo's house as well not just the kitchen <laughs> in, the in the philippines, philippines. <laughs> oh right i want i want one <laughs> so do you see a slowdown for of work on 2023? Because people are talking about recession. And my, my follow-up question to that is, you know, we're all busy right now, but have you thought of a way to future-proof your business? So that's those are, those are dual questions there, Aya. So 2023 is going to affect everybody in very different ways because people who have money are con going to continue to have money. People who have less or who have had to... Um, budget anything, they're not going to to do what they had intended possibly. Uh, most of our clients, depending on location, they will continue to build. Um, it doesn't make me necessarily, it makes me happy personally because our business is going strong. But um, if you want to branch, you know, expand that into general politics and life, this is a shame. To future proof, let's skip over to your next question. How do you future proof yourself? Diversify. So, buying the building that we then renovated put us on the ground floor. We have people walking in. Um, the intention was simply to have an Evo Domus ish space to bring our clients, our house clients, so that they can do their specification fit out. Now that we actually have a showroom type situation, of course, there are people in Cleveland, Ohio, who love modern architecture and who love modern kitchens and everything else, the, the windows. So yes, we thought that that would be a good idea, but really it was almost like forced on us 
of course, we're going to sell windows, cabinetry, and everything else to anybody who might, might not even be buying a house from us. So in that way, we have diversified in that the big projects come and go. And when they when one drops out, that's a big, you feel it. But if you have a constant light rainfall of cabinetry sales or window sales, that just makes you more stable. You know, getting rid of the big rocks at the bottom of the lake when the water dries up, do that ahead of time before it slows down. That's what I have found has worked for us in managing the ups and downs. The diversity. Yeah. So any advice you would give to new firm owners in general, in navigating ups and downs in either a partnership or business development or finance? You know, I, uh, I have found, and it's helped me even in, in the last couple of years with our own business, educate yourself. Simply listen to all of these really wonderful podcasts. Be picky. Be choosy. Don't listen to crap. You, you can recognize things that are not that valuable, but there are a lot of good good podcasts out there and bits of information where you can learn through other people's experiences. You don't really need to have every bad experience yourself. Um, And you don't have to run and find a partner. Sometimes it's simply going through the weeks, the months, the years Mm -hmm. with sincerely very open eyes. And sometimes that person who you might partner up with is unexpected. Many times it's it's the personality and skill set, not necessarily the experience that another person might have. That I think is fascinating in not necessarily finding a partner, but maybe finding somebody, a, a staff member who grows into someone who might be a load sharing perhaps partner or not, but somebody really um, hiring. That's the the most difficult aspect of it is to, to be selective and keep your eyes open in every case. And of course, educate yourself, learn as much as you can. So I like what you said. I say this a lot. A smart person learns from their mistakes, Yes, but, but a genius, genius learns, learns from, from the mistakes, mistakes yes. of others. Yes, absolutely. Yes, right. I agree 100%. So, so I, I, like I like to talk, to talk about, about work-life, work-life balance. balance. Michelle, <laughs> Michelle, who is, who is Michelle, Michelle outside of Evo Domus? <laughs> Michelle outside of Evo Domus is mom to Natalie and Nick. I have to say my my kids and my family, uh, I, my, my mom and dad and sisters are very nearby, um, an hour away. So beyond being a sister and daughter, my, my priority is um, to my kids, to Nick, he's 16, Natalie's 13. These are the most important years. I often think, and we talk openly about it, is I'm going to be very sad when they don't like love to hang out with me. So um, I, this is my, I've mentioned this also, this is like my, my fourth or fifth life, I feel. This is the life where being, um, being a mom and uh, kicking, kicking butt with being a business owner, that's what's important to me right now. Okay. I've I've lived the uh, let's explore Europe. You know, I've I've been through that, and it was wonderful. It has informed who I am now. But right now, this is who I am. The fifties, this is it. So, so what's, what's next, next for Evo Domus, and what's, what's next, next for Michelle? You decide in what order. Oh, oh, good questions. You know what? I just feel like we are um, heading up to the peak of of optimization. So it's going to be more of the same. I love the outreach aspect that we have of, you know, really the clients who, who we're, we're building for right now. They are truly interested in what we do and what they're going to be living in. And that was if, if I go back and reread the uh, our website, you know, that was written a decade ago, but it still rings true. I, I like the idea of influencing people who will then turn around and influence more people. Um, I, I think that that could be a way to, to move forward to just smarter ways of, of building and existing and um, not living with excess. You know, all of our houses, one of them was very big, but a lot of them are sincerely not huge. It's more uh, quality versus quantity and that type and and energy uh, smartness you know no fossil fuels all all of these things that our clients get as um, let's say the side effect you know it's not not the most important thing but we will talk about it and you will get it whether you want it or not you know that's and what's, and what's next, next for Michelle for me you know, I I don't know 
I just, I have to say, I haven't been this happy in a very long time. I love life. I love what I'm doing. I love uh, where I am. And I just, uh, yeah, it's a really good question. Let's talk in a year and see what has changed and what hasn't changed. That's great. <laughs> I really, really enjoyed this conversation, Michelle. And thanks for um, sharing a lot of your insights and stories in our podcast. Oh, I, it was wonderful, as always. I love, I love being around you. That was Michelle Colby of Evo Domus. Thanks for listening to this episode of Architect My Life, a podcast brought to you by the MGS Global Group. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you would like to add to the conversation through your own experiences, I encourage you to be a guest on one of our upcoming episodes. Visit architectmylife.com slash apply to learn how. I firmly believe that a strong community drives change and fosters success. If you'd like to be part of this community, join the all-female Architect My Life Facebook group. Please take a moment to review us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. We'd love to hear from you. Be sure to follow me on Instagram at Aya underscore Architect My Life and Architect My Life Podcast. Thanks again for listening. I'm Aya Schlachter. Until next time.